Hello, everyone. Good morning. I hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. We miss having everyone together for lunch and learn downstairs, but this is the best um, we can do given our circumstances today. So we're going to make it work for all of us. I'm going to go over quite a few items that affect 2020 and some items for 2021. And I'd encourage you to send me your questions through the chat box and we will go through the questions at the, um, at the end of the presentation. So today's discussion is um, a discussion of a general nature. I'm not here to give specific tax advice to anyone. If you have specific questions, you can, you're welcome to call me later or speak with your tax advisor um, at a later date. Questions at the end or will be welcomed. And so let's get started talking about what I think is the most important item that affects all of us, you as taxpayers and me as tax preparers, and that is being safe online. There are emails and there are texts coming out to thousands and thousands of people every day saying that if you click on a link or you open on a link, you're going to get some money back. And if you do this, you're going to get $1,500 back or something like that. None of that is true. Don't be tempted to answer these phony emails or text. The IRS does not call you. The IRS does not have your email address and the IRS will not send you a text or an email. Also notice that if the IRS occasionally sends emails, their email address is irs.gov, not irs.com. In the few instances where I have received emails from the IRS, it's because I'm working with an agent on a case and the agent tells me ahead of time that I'm gonna be getting emails from him or her. This is going to be a problem. And it's going to start up as soon as tax season starts uh, going. And this year, tax season starts February 12th, because February 12th is the first day that IRS is accepting individual tax returns for 2020. Um, so be on the lookout. It's really tempting to click on these links. Do not. Do not click on these links. Um, and the IRS is really making a pitch to taxpayers and tax preparers. And this next slide comes right off, right from the IRS website where they send, where they tell you, if you do receive one of these phony scam text or email, they would like to know who it, they'd like to know who sent it as much as possible. And they investigate some of these and they're trying to shut it down. So just remember, IRS is not going to call you. IRS is not going to send you an email. IRS is not going to send you a text. The Georgia Department of Revenue also does not send emails and does not send texts unless you're working on a case with them. So in order to combat this tax identity theft, the IRS has come up with um, with what I think is an excellent idea, and it's going to start getting traction this year and I think going forward, and that you're going to get a six-digit PIN number from the IRS. And that number is going to be is going to be supposed to be included on your tax return. So when you either e-file or paper file, that six-digit number needs to be included on the return. If you e-file, there's going to be a space there to put it and if you paper file it's on the bottom of page two of form 1040 where you where you sign the return if they issued you a pin and you do not get the pin and do, and do not put the pin number on the return the return is not going to be accepted and it's going to be sent back to you and it's as though you have not filed so the way it's supposed to work and this is new to them so they're sort of making and working the rules as they go along is in December of each year, you're going to get a letter in the mail saying that there, this is your pin for the upcoming year. 
and, and save that sheet of paper because it's important. And if you want to go to the extra layer of support, if you're doing a married filing joint return, you may want to get a pin for both spouses. I think a pin for one will be good. A pin, a pin for both of them will be even better. And the pin is only good for one year. So if you get a pin for 2020, you cannot use it anymore. It's only for 2020. And so I want to go on to the next slide. And oops. And, and so if you want to get a pin from the IRS, you go to the IRS website that I have at the bottom of the slide, irs.gov. And in the search box on the upper right hand corner, type IPPIN. And it's going to go through a very secure um, set of questions where you're going to know the answers if it's, tr if it's you, and, they're, and you're going to be validating your identity to them. I highly, highly recommend that everyone does this. It, it just makes it much safer, uh, and there's no, no um, the scanners, scammers that are out there do not have access to this number. And so um, consider doing this. From what I've been able to read on the IRS website, if you apply for a PIN, you're going to get a PIN that is for 2021. And it's not real clear, but from what I've read, it's for 2021 tax returns. I do not think it's for 2020 returns. So I'm hoping that when you get your letter from the service, that it will tell you what year is from. I do not know if they're done sending pins out for 2020 or not. This is something they've resisted for a long time and they finally um, acquiesced to doing it. Georgia is the second uh, state with the most tax fraud. So this is a welcome news for all Georgia taxpayers. No one likes getting these letters from IRS or from the Georgia Department of Revenue. So if you get one of these letters, it's not necessarily bad news all the time. Open it, read it, and address it. The, um, sometimes I've had some situations where clients don't exactly remember what estimates they've, they've made and IRS says, we've got extra money sitting on your account. Tell us what to do with it, refund it or apply it to the next year. And when I go over the information with my clients, they say, oh, I made this estimated tax payment and I didn't tell you about it. So the money's not lost and the money can be, and that refund overpayment can be addressed. Unfortunately, dealing with the IRS right now is difficult in that they have moved their staff to processing these um, economic impact payments, the, the uh, refunds, for millions and millions of taxpayers. So offices that are normally open are not. And so sometimes when I call IRS and there is a special number for tax practitioners to call, I get on, on the recording is we are busy and we cannot take your call at this time, call back another day. Not good for me and not good for taxpayers. And unfortunately, you may experience that. But if you do, call back a day or two more. I think they're improving on it and they know that it is an issue. One of the problems that they had is earlier in 2020, the IRS pretty much totally shut down and moved their staff to process the first refund checks, those economic imp um, impact payments. And so their mail was not open for March, April and May of 2020. And there are millions and millions and millions of correspondence, checks, tax returns sitting in those mail rooms that the IRS has. They have started working through that backlog, but it may take another three months for them to get through it. And, and, and as they get through it, they're going to start getting more notices, refunds, uh, questions from taxpayers, questions from people like me for 2020 tax returns. So we're dealing with a difficult situation. They say they're doing the best they can, and they probably are. And I've had clients that call me and I sent a check three months ago, and the check hasn't been, hasn't been cashed. Well, the check is sitting in their mailroom. 
then clients keep getting letters from the service, you haven't filed this tax return, the tax return is sitting in their mailroom. So it's a, it's a difficult situation for taxpayers and for um, tax practitioners, and um, patience is gonna be needed on both our ends. I talked about um, dealing with Georgia, and Georgia, believe it or not, when you call them, there's a number that's on their Georgia website and a human being picks it up. You don't have to, the recording is really short and they're pretty good about that. And uh, the people that work in that department, of course, dealing with the state is a lot more manageable than dealing with the whole country and they're doing a pretty good job. But Georgia is going to be shutting down their computer systems for about five or six days, starting February 5th of this week and they're gonna be opening up on February 11th. So from February 5th to February 10th, you can't call them, I can't call them, and they're not going to be answering any calls because they can't get any taxpayer information. So if you're dealing with Georgia, please be advised that um, for that time period, it is, um, it's, it's not gonna be working, um, but they should be up and running by February 11th as they say on their website at eight in the morning. Let's hope all that works through. So I just want to reiterate that um, the most important thing I, I'm going to mention all morning today is about the scam emails and text messages. Do not respond to them. Um, some of you have called me occasionally what to do. Well, if someone does call you, hang up. Do not engage them in conversation. Um, and do not acknowledge who you are, by no means. If IRS or Georgia wants to get a hold of you, you're going to get a letter in the mail. So it's, they make it tempting and they say, if you call us, give us your information, we're going to send you a refund check. Well, that doesn't work. That does, that's just not going to happen. So now let's talk about some changes for 2020 and for 2021. Um, and I'm just gonna move up one slide and, and then I'm gonna come back to the slide I was just with. Notice that the standard deductions for 2020 and for 2021 are double what they used to be for 2017. For married filing joint is 24,800. Uh, for 20 and for 21 is 25,100. So as a consequence of having higher standard deductions, a lot of taxpayers, this is, this is going happening all over the country, are not itemizing because um, their actual itemized deductions are a lot less. When I mention actual itemized deductions, I'm talking about um, medical, home mortgage interest, real estate taxes, and charitable contributions. So most people take the standard deduction unless something is going on on their return. Like unfortunately, they may have a lot of medical or they year decide to make a lot of charitable contributions. So Congress wanted to encourage taxpayers to make more contributions to charity. So for 2020, even if you do not itemize, you get an extra $300 deduction. This is not a big deal. The $300 is not gonna make or break anyone, but it's a nice little gesture. And so the 300 for 2020 applies whether you're single or you're married. And it's above what, tax practitioners call above the line of deduction for AGI. For 2021, Congress doubled it, 300 for single and 600 for married filing joint. Um, like I said, not a big deal, but, in, but every little bit helps. And in 2021, Congress moved where the location is deducted on your tax return, and it is in addition to the standard deduction for 2021. So what should you do if you do not itemize because your itemized deductions um, aren't sufficient enough over those, num over those base numbers that I just mentioned and you are over 70 and a half and you wanna reduce your taxes, well, you could make what is called a qualified charitable distribution from your IRA. So. In 2020, we all had a vacation from requirement minimum distributions from your IRA, 
but required minimum distributions are back for 2021. Here's what happened during 2020. For most of you on the call, you did not take your required minimum distributions because you didn't have to. What happened to the stock market? The stock market went up. So when you don't take money out and the value of the account goes up, you're going to be dealing with a higher required minimum distribution for 2021 because it's based on the value of the IRA on December 31st, 2020. So the required minimum distribution is going to be larger than it probably has been in prior years. So if you want to save taxes, you can make what is called a qualified charitable distribution from your IRA. And so what you do is you tell your IRA trustee that um, instead of paying you, you pay your church, you pay the goodwill, the United Way, any 501c3 organization that you choose. So if your required minimum distribution is 12000 and you want to send 2000 to the United Way, you're going to get taxed on 10000 the difference between 12000 and 2000 And there's a limit of 100000 per year. I've not seen anyone come close to that limit. So it has to be a, a straight cash contribution from the IRA. It needs to go from your IRA trustee directly to the 501c3 organization. A lot of you in the past have made donations to your church because we process those, con those contributions in our office. And it works out very, very well. The only issue that we have as for me as a tax preparer is the 1099 forms that re report the, the, the IRA distributions don't indicate how much went to a charity. So I'm depending on you, my client, to tell me how much went to charity. So if you got your, if you got $12,000, if you took out $12,000 and, and 2,000 went to the church, you're gonna get a 1099R for $12,000. And so the, the reporting burden on the taxpayer to indicate on the tax return that the 2,000 went to the church to a 501c3 organization. I was hoping by now that the service would have a code for that, but they have not. Um, it would make things a lot easier and particularly the IRA trustees know when the money's going to charity, they send the checks. It couldn't really be easier than that. So give that some thought. And, and just as a practical matter, don't do your qualified charitable distributions the last week of December. That's not a good time. The checks may not get to the organization. The money may not leave your account by December 31st because all the IRA trustees are. Um, are processing millions of these transactions. And just as one, just want to reiterate, you have to be 70 and a half at the time that you make this qualified charitable contribution. And also remember that the law was changed recently and required minimum distributions now start at age 72. So we've had a lot of changes. Um, we've had a lot of changes in the IRA rules. We all change it in a charitable contribution rules. And a lot of times it's just difficult to keep track of what you're getting, um, what you're going to get deducted and can you and what the reporting forms are going to say. But take it one step at a time and, uh, and then just follow the process so that you keep track of your contributions and you know what to expect. Remember, the 1099R is not going to tell you what you donated to charity. That's your responsibility to do on your return or tell your tax preparer. So these are the standard deductions that I was mentioning. So the reason I think in the past, like 60% of the American taxpayers took the itemized deductions. Now with the standard deduction being so high, it's about 85% are taking the standard uh, because their actual itemized deductions are so much less than these numbers. And if you're 65 or over in for 2020, you get an extra 1300 and for 21, you get an extra 1350. So um, you see these numbers help you and but so they help you. But the point I, I want to make also 
is that if your itemized deductions turn out to be $27,000, which is a lot of deductions, you're not getting a big tax benefit because of the uh, higher standard deductions. You don't have control of your taxes, and for the most part, you don't have control when you pay your medical expenses, but you have total control of when you do your charitable contributions. And if you see that you're going to have a lot of medical expenses or your taxes on your home went way up, you may want to consider bunching up your charitable contributions so you go over the standard deduction. Going over a thousand or two over the standard deduction amount is not a big tax deduction because the tax law builds in 24,800 already. And if your actual is 26,000, it's not much of a deduction for you. So give that some thought. And the way to give that some thought is to plan ahead. A question that comes up every year is making gifts to family members and non-family members. So for 2020 and for 2021, you can make a gift of $15,000 to one individual. Married filing joint taxpayers can give $30,000 to, to one individual. What happens if you, let's just say a single person wants to give $25,000 to one person? Well, it's not going to cost them tax, but they have to file a gift tax return because they made a gift that was larger than the annual exclusion. And it uses up your lifetime um, estate and gift tax exemption, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes some more. So the 15,000 or the 30,000, and, and when you make a gift to someone, it's not zero or 15,000. If you wanna make a gift of 5,000, 10,000, 12,000, that's, that's fine too. I'm sure whoever receives it is gonna be most, most appreciative. It doesn't have to be the maximum, and it doesn't have to be paid at one time, although just keep, keep track of how much you pay to one individual. So the person that makes the gift, the donor, does not receive a tax deduction for the gift, and the person that receives the gift, the donee, does not include the gift amount in his or her income. Then there's something in the law that's made, um, that is, is actually really good. If someone wants to pay, let's give an example, parents or grandparents want to help their adult children with medical and education expenses. Um, if, if someone wants to pay for someone's medical expenses, it's in addition to the 15 or 30,000 that I have above on the slide, but there's just a couple of rules you have to follow. If a parent wants to pay for a child's medical expenses, they have to pay the medical provider directly. You do not write the check to your child, the child deposit and makes the medical and pays a medical provider. It's gotta go from the parent to the medical provider directly. Um, and, and the parent can still give the 15 or the 30,000 to a child if, if they want to. For education, it's only for tuition. And once again, the parent or the grandparent has to pay directly to the university or the school, not to the parent or not to the person going to school, and then that person pays the school. It's got to go directly to the school and on education, it's for tuition only, does not include books, fees, um, all those other fees that students unfortunately have to pay. So this is a good planning tool. It's something that um, parents and grandparents can use to help the lower generation and there's no taxes to pay. And if someone needs to make a, a gift larger than the 15 or the 30, the worst thing is they have to file a gift tax return and that's not that bad. You just have to file one. And, um, and a lot of times I get asked the question, well, what happens if I don't file? What's the big deal? The big deal is that if, you're, if you give someone, let's just say one person gives 25,000 to, um, to an individual, their son, daughter, or, or anyone, doesn't have to be related to you, and they get audited and the agent picks up a receipt for $25,000 and the taxpayer says, oh, that was a gift from one of my relatives. And the agent's gonna say, well, I'm gonna go check the gift tax returns. 
to see one was filed. If a gift tax return was not filed, the agent's going to say it's income. And it may be tough to file a gift tax return under audit for that taxpayer. So that's why you want to do it. You want to do it right and you want to do it on time. And it's simple to do. This is going to be a big deal for 2020 and for 2021. Those economic impact payments that you receive, the first thing I want to let you know is they are not taxable for federal income tax purposes. And as far as I've seen, Georgia is not going to tax them. So this is one of the things that was brought upon by the CARES Act due in response to the coronavirus. And so what the federal government wanted to do was get as much money out to the taxpayers as fast as possible. So they wanted to, so the law was written that is based on your 2020 income. Well, we don't know what your 2020 income is because we haven't filed any 2020 tax returns yet. So they based it on either 18 or 19 income. And if you're one of those years was lower than the other, you got you got the most you could get based on your income for either 18 or 19. So now all the taxpayers are going to settle up with the service. And believe it or not, I've got good news on this. Let's say that your income for 2020 is higher than it was for 18 and 19, the years that they base some of those tax refunds from. So you do not have to pay that back. And let's say your income for 2020 was much lower. You're going to be entitled to get the refund based on a higher income level. So you'll be probably receive some sort of refund on that. Here's where the tax complexity comes in with paperwork. So you should have received a letter if you received the first estimated uh, tax payment. Um, the first estimated, the first rebate, the economic impact payment, a letter earlier in 2020 for the first one. The letter for the second economic impact payment that was paid in January of 2021, and they're still paying some of those, those have not been sent yet to taxpayers, but they will. And you're going to need the information on those letters, or you're going to need to go through your records and see what those refunds were that you got. Um, you may have even got one or two, and you're gonna to need to know that to do your 2020 tax return. So, so th and there's obviously a new line to report it and the instructions to, to form 1040, I have a, uh, a worksheet that's a whole page. When I saw that, I was like, why is this so complicated? Well, you go through a whole rigmarole of things and, and then to get to whether, um, whether you owe money. And if you owe money, you don't have to pay it because your income is higher. And if your income was less and you're entitled to a bigger refund from either the first or the second stimulus payment, you're gonna get that money back. So this is a win-win situation for all taxpayers. And this is what the what Congress decided to do to help taxpayers and the economy out um, as a coronavirus was taking hit. And they expected the economy to greatly slow down and unfortunately it did. So, so you may wanna start looking for that paperwork or look in your deposits for these amounts so you have them ready because you're gonna to need to know this for your 2020 tax returns. A question that comes up um, every three, four months it, um, that runs through me is, what about selling the house? A lot of people still remember the old rule. The old rule was once in a lifetime exemption and you could exclude $125,000 of gain. The law was changed in 1997. Ronald Reagan was president at the time. So that's how long this law has been in effect. So if you are single, you can exclude the gain up to $250,000 on selling your residence. If married, filing joint, you can exclude $500,000. In the last 10 years since I've been doing tax returns and reporting sale of, of clients' homes, no one has paid tax on selling a house because of these exclusions. 
So this is, talk about being pro-taxpayer, this is very, very pro-taxpayer. And this is, a, this is very handy for us living in Georgia. If you were living in perhaps New York City, where a condo for a million dollars is not a big deal, it's probably a small unit, um, you could easily exclude, you could easily go over those amounts. But so you could do this, sell your house every two years if you want to, if you're interested in moving and, and moving to a new house and then making your new house your residence. And then you, so you could do this every two years and exclude the gain every year. There's no limit how, much, how often you could do this. And so remember that it's the gain that gets excluded. And the gain is the difference between the sales price of the house and your cost of the house, how much you paid for the house and improvements you have put in over the years. And if you've been in the house for 40 years, you know, you may have a tough time coming up with the improvements. I encourage you to do as best you can, estimate numbers if you have to, because you, you want to come, as, you, there's opportunity to exclude almost all the gain, but you got to have some sort of backup. Then when one spouse dies and the, remain, and the surviving spouse stays in the house, the surviving spouse has two years from the time the first spouse passed away to sell the house and still use the $500,000 exclusion, even though at the time that, that spouse is single. And so what's happening in my experience and working with many of you is that People want to stay in their homes, and particularly after a spouse dies, the, re the surviving spouse wants to stay in their home, and they don't sell the house until they have to, and that's way past the two years, and then you're back to the two fifty dollars or the $500,000 rule. But for someone that's got a big uh, gain, a large gain on selling the residence, you may want to consider that. And a lot of realtors are not aware of this, of, of this part of the law. Let's talk about Georgia. So Georgia does not tax you on your social security benefits if they're taxed on the federal return. Georgia has a retirement deduction, which is based on age for each spouse. Between 62 and 64, it's up to 35,000 per spouse, and 65 and older, it's 65,000 per spouse. And the reason Georgia put this in the law is they were tired of people retiring from work and moving either to Tennessee or Florida. And what do those states have in common? They have no individual income tax. So Georgia said, we want to keep our retirees here. We want them to be taxpayers and pay tax. So we're going to give them a break. So this is the break. So if, if to, to, uh, married filing joint return, you can potentially exclude up to $130,000 of income on your return but the income has to be per, it's per spouse. So for example, if um, let's say a brokerage account has $25,000 of dividend income, each spouse would be allocated half of that 12,500. Obviously if one of the spouses is working and gets a W-2, then that gets allocated to the spouse that does the work, but earned income is only limited to 4,000 in computing the retirement deduction. So Georgia is pretty good on this. And so in addition to excluding Social Security, you can exclude a lot of your income. And Georgia does not tax you on interest and dividends from U.S. and Georgia government obligations. The, the maximum tax bracket for 2020, and I think it's going to be for 2021, for Georgia is 5.75. Used to be 6. Uh, so... Um, Georgia is not that bad when it comes to state income taxes. Georgia has, um, as part of their website, um, a new division that they call the Georgia Tax Center. You may have noticed you no longer receive that 1099 from the Department of Revenue that when you got an overpayment on the prior year tax, they stopped issuing that. So if you want to verify what your refund was and make sure that no changes were made 
And one of the things Georgia does not do very well is they may change your refund and not tell the taxpayer. Then when you file your tax return for the subsequent year and you report a larger refund, a, a refund that doesn't agree to their records, letters come out. And so this is good. Every, ta every Georgia taxpayer can set up an account with the Georgia Tax Center. There is the link to set it up. You can view your balances. If you move, you can change your address, let them know. You can request refunds, view copies of correspondence, and obtain that refund check form 1099G that they stop mailing it. I suspect they stop mailing it because they want to cut down their cost. But this is a handy thing to do for a lot of clients of mine that have issues with Georgia. I get to register them um, after they send me a power of attorney and I have access to all their Georgia activity and it makes things a lot easier. But you can also do this for yourself. I recommend it. So I have about 10, 15 more minutes before I, we go to questions. So I want to address the Biden tax proposals. And the most important thing I'm gonna tell you is this is what his proposals have been as of today. This is subject to change. It's subject to negotiation with Congress. And there is a possibility there may not be any tax changes. What I see happening is taxes is not a top five priority for the new Biden administration. I think there's a lot of issues to deal with the coronavirus and that's, uh, that's gonna take up a lot of time and resources. So we may not hear about tax proposals or tax changes until later on in the year. What I do see happening is if tax changes are made, they're gonna be effective in 2022, maybe even 2023. And so in particularly with some, some of the higher income, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, CPAs like me are telling their clients something we've never said before, 2021 may be a very good year to bring a lot of gains into your tax return and pay the tax. Number one is we know what it's going to be. And in particularly, if we know there's a tax increase for 2022 and you're considering selling an asset or security, you may want to do it in 2021. A lot of clients that um, are working and they get the option of deferring their bonus, I'm encouraging them to take their bonus in 2021. That may change depending on what we hear going on, but I don't think we're going to hear anything about tax proposals for several more months. The most controversial part of President Biden's proposals is to do away with a step up in, step up in assets when someone passes away. So let's take this example. Taxpayer bought his house 40 years ago for $25,000. Over the years, he made improvements of 175. At the time of his death, the house is worth 700,000. So if, it, if the law stays the way it is today and taxpayers' heirs inherit the house, their basis is $700,000, the date of death value at the time where the tax, when the taxpayer passed away. So the beneficiaries sell the property for $725,000 they have a gain of $25,000. That's pretty good, that is really good, and it's automatically a long-term capital gain. Whenever you inherit property from someone, it's automatically long-term. So with the tax proposal, there is no step up in death. On the decedent's final tax return, there'll be a capital gain to report of $525,000 which is the difference between 725,000 and 200,000 of assets. We don't know if the $250,000 exclusion is gonna apply or not, because this is just a general tax proposal. Well, where do you think the money's gonna come from to pay the taxes if this goes through? They're gonna to have to sell the house. So if the beneficiaries wanted to hold the house and convert it to rental property or move into the house, they may not have that option. We've had, this is what is called carryover basis, and we had that in the law in the late 1970s, and it was horrendous. Taxpayers couldn't do it, practitioners couldn't do it, the IRS couldn't follow it. So I'm, so I'm actually disappointed that this was 
brought up again because it makes things so much more difficult in addition to being a huge tax increase. So um, pay attention. You're going to know when I'm going to know when this gets brought up and see what's ultimately going to happen. I, am, I would love to see this go away and just go back to the date of death value and give the beneficiaries a higher basis and little or no tax to pay. Or get, and that way there's no taxes and no assets need to be sold on an emergency basis. Remember, if someone, if based on this proposal, someone dies today, you got to pay the tax on this next April 15th. That's not that long. Um, you got to do a lot of things. You know, um, you, you need to, uh, you may have to clean up the house. You may have to get it, um, improvements to the house and sell it and close on it. But the tax is due April 15th. So um, I hope this does not come through, but keep, keep uh, know that it is a proposal which is why I'm bringing it up. Um, and it is, it is not good, but that's, that's my opinion. Other proposals is if your income is over 400,000, um, the, the tax proposals is to raise the top rate from 37 to 39.6. Um, and you say, well, it's only less than 3%. Well, it's, it's actually, if you're making that kind of money, it's a lot extra tax. So um, once again, I think this is, this is certainly not pro-taxpayer. If they want to increase the taxes on higher income taxpayers, maybe that 400 needs to be brought up to a much higher amount. Taxes on long-term capital gains and qualifying dividends this year and for the past several years has been either 15 or 20% depending on your income. So with the Biden tax proposals, if your income is over a million dollars, they're gonna be taxed as ordinary income. Um, so this is, once again, I think this is, this is awful. And then the other proposal he's got, which is equally awful, is if you make an, when you deduct your itemized deductions, if your income is over 400,000, they're going to limit how much you can deduct. So we've had this in the law before, and it just made tax returns more complicated. And my take is if taxpayers want to make um, charitable contributions in particular, let them make it and don't, don't uh, push back on it. Let them deduct the whole thing. But this is, this is called, these three items here on this slide is called tax complexity in addition to being a pretty big tax increase. So, like I said, I don't know when these proposals are going, if they're going to go through, when they're going to go through, and when they're going to be effective. But at least I wanted you to be aware that they have been proposed. And we'll monitor the situation um, going forward to see what actually gets enacted. Remember, tax legislation needs to be enacted by Congress and signed by the president. So it's not just what the administration wants. Congress has got to pass the legislation to agree to this. Um, one good thing that the proposals have is to reestablish the first time home, homeowners uh, tax credit when you buy a new house. And um, that would be beneficial and the credit would be up to $15,000. And a credit means that if your tax liability is 22,000, and you bought a house and you're entitled to this proposed credit, your taxes are going down to 7,000. That's a huge, huge help. Um, and if this does go through, and if it goes through, maybe it's going to get modified and maybe the 15 will get uh, reduced to eight, nine, 10, 12,000 dollars, even a smaller amount, it's a big help. So that's the good news on the slide. The bad news on the slide is he wants to increase the estate and gift tax, reduce the exemption to three and a half million and raise the rates from 40 to 45%. So we're just gonna have to wait and see if and when these changes happen and when they will be effective. As of right now, I would not make any transactions on, um, on, um, on these proposals because they are, they are not going anywhere but it's worth paying attention. 
So we are ready to take your questions. And um, let's see there. Um, so someone said, do I need a pen if you are a victim of identity theft? The answer is yes, with a capital Y. But my understanding is the service should have sent you a pen automatically if you're a victim of identity theft. And then the other thing I got to say is some of those letters that they're sending out may be held back in the mail. The mail is slow and the IRS is slow. So it, normally you should get those letters in December uh, and um, you still may get one in January. You may still get one in February. What else? Is there anything else that um, we should talk about? So 2020 should be pretty much the same filing season as 2019. The only paperwork you're going to need is those econo economic um, income payments, those refunds that, you, that if you received any, and they should be, um, you need to know those amounts before you file your tax return. And I encourage you to get a PIN, uh, even if it's effective for 2021, it's still, I think it's good security. And that way you have peace of mind that the return went through and no one else can file one. Remember, if you get a PIN and the return goes without it, whether it's e-filed or paper filed, the return is going to get rejected. So if you, if you do, so the, 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 um, the question came back, if you are not a victim of identity theft, is it, a good, is it a good idea to get a pin? Yes, I still is. But like I said, I think the pins that they're issuing now are for 2021 returns, based on what I see on the IRS website. So uh, please give us some thought. If you have a question, send it through. We got a few minutes that we will answer them. You may want to use this time. You're probably receiving all your tax forms at this time. Put them all together. Uh, the 1099s is easy. Put them in a folder. What requires some work from, um, from you as a taxpayer is to organize your medical expenses, your charitable contributions. And if you are over 70 and a half and make contributions from your IRA, get that information together too. You're going to need it to do your tax return, whether it gets done by a tax professional or you do it on your own. So um, it's not too, it's good time to start getting that information. And this is advice I'm taking myself. I have done that for myself already. And I'm just waiting for a couple 1099s to come in and I'll be ready to file my tax return as soon as they get in. So we're just gonna wait another few seconds and see if there's any other questions. And um, I wanna thank you for uh, joining us today, for your participation. I hope I made you think about a, a few things, made you aware what's gonna be coming for 2020 taxes, and made you aware what's going to be for what potentially could happen for 2021. Um, it's not too early to start planning for 2021, but you need to know what the rules are gonna be. And right now, we do not know what the rules are. So if there are no questions, then we will end today's session. Once again, thank you. If I can help you with anything, you know how to reach me, send me an email or uh, give me a call and I'll try to help. And again, thank you for your time this morning.